Well, hey, everybody, this is Mitch Ashley, and, and, I, and I'm Alan Schimmel, and you're listening to Security Boulevard Chat, out yeah, on the baby. boulevard. On the boulevard. Yeah, baby. Uh-huh. <laughs> not Back cellulite. The, what's that? Or, not Hollywood Boulevard and Hollywood. celluloid heroes. I think of that every <laughs> time we say this. Me too. <laughs> Me too. You know, one of my great memories, Mitch, I went to St. John's undergrad, St. John's University, and the Kinks played at what today is Lou Karnasek Arena. Back then it was, wow. I think, just Alumni Hall. Uh-huh. And um, I volunteered to be a usher for the show, oh, okay. which means they gave me a free T-shirt. Uh-huh. I made sure everyone was sitting in their seats. And then once the show started, I went down, like sat on the first row there, right in between seats and had, you know, watching Ray Davies, like right on top of me. And man, that was a great concert. That was awesome. Hollywood been to so many great concerts. I heroes. lived in the concert desert of Nebraska, which we didn't have that many good we yeah, had concerts, no. but not like New York, nothing like that. No, we, well, at St. John's, the biggest ones we had was that King show. We had Meatloaf and I think the Allman Brothers. The Allman <laughs> Brothers were a great show there. This is back in the day when they were alive. Yeah. Um, well, Dwayne was gone already, but anyway, um, we regress, Mitch. We're yes. here to talk about security and cyber and all that good stuff. What do you got? You know, I want to bring up a, a kind of a different topic than we've talked about before. Uh, Brian Krebs, who we you all know, you know, if you've been security, sure. you know who Brian Krebs is. You know, with the, I guess he was with the Washington Post originally, right? Yeah, um, but he's been Krebs on security now for a long time. That's right. He has Krebs on security. He had this interesting article about uh, why your Wi-Fi router doubles as an Apple AirTag. Long way of saying, essentially, there was, I think it was University of Maryland, uh, was doing a study and found that our Apple devices, while they're roaming around networks, and we always have these features like, you know, turn on Wi-Fi so it improves your, your, your cellular or your network performance. Well, some of it is about geolocation, also improving geolocation. But the point here was that all of our Apple devices, at least in that ecosystem, are collecting data about every access point that it sees as you're traversing through going over to Costco or you're driving down the down the highway or you went to the mall or at the movie theater, or whatever, wherever you go or you're traveling on the airplane somewhere, all of us are providing data into back into the back end of Apple systems about Wi-Fi access points. Now, what exactly all data that they're capturing is not totally clear, but the University of Maryland did this study where they actually pulled publicly accessible data out of that information and could map sort of movement of people in Ukraine and in Gaza and places where there's a lot of, you know, disruption happening. And you can just imagine like, well, what else, who else might want to use that information? Maybe people who are involved in those conflicts or maybe- sure. Cyber threats. So it's a combination of, you know, we, we heard about geofencing when we went to the mall. It could tell you where yeah. you went to what stores. Now yep. that's happening on a, on a macro level. And it made me think, you know, Apple's big on our, our security, you know, take securing our data. Uh, is that a little bit too much information that's leaking, even though it's not specifically about us? You know, I'm curious your thoughts on it. Well, you know, early on in the Ukrainian-Russian uh war, call it a conflict or whatever the Putin and those guys decide to call it, special operation. Um, I know the Ukrainians were triangulating Russian soldiers using cell. Mm -hmm. And that would give away their position and they could zero in their smart missiles and bombs to take them out. And as a result, you know, a lot of Russian soldiers died and I think the Russian army put sort of a stop on you know, soldiers using their phones they're, they're, you know, in, in these positions because it's a dead giveaway. I don't know if that's the same technology or that was cell phone towers. I think it's cell phone towers. Yeah. I mean, sure. cell phone towers will give you a decent location. When you're using Wi-Fi, they really can triangulate in on you, mm-hmm. you know, based on your WAPs and stuff like that. So obviously it's it's an information leak there. On the other hand, I'm not quite sure, and I, I, you know, I'll go back to read the Krebs article. The Apple information, how is it being accessed by anyone? 
right? I mean, the app, Apple doesn't make that publicly available. I'm thinking there there apparently is some publicly public information, and they were talking about Apple and satellite based broadband services like Starlink um, that they could co- do some correlation and tell from that um, and some of these implications about geolocated devices where like they I'm are, wondering can they two. can they grab a Mac address from your device and then w- follow where that Mac address is is linking on to a WAP or a Starlink or what have you yeah it's so, okay assume that Mac address is Mitchell's phone and Mitchell's phone was went from this wireless access point to that wireless access point so we know where Mitchell's going here Right, you're spot on, and they're capturing the MAC address of all the access points that you're seeing. Right. So well, that's and, how and, they correlate it back to the same access. Sure, point. and and you know, so but are those MAC address points publicly? Obviously, they must be if this is what they're doing. And so, yeah, Go you ahead. know, if they're doing it in the Ukraine and Gaza, I'm assuming they're probably doing it for FBI and and criminal matters as well. And you know, um, it just, you know, this is why you can't have nice things on the internet. <laughs> Get out but, your Nokia flip phone. Yeah. You know, or just two tin cans, send a send a letter or a postcard. Stop. Yeah. You know, um, I, I don't know a way around it unless, you know, because there are valid reasons to have that information out there. It, it is, and I wonder, so apparently some of the information is available through an API. Both, both Google does this too, by the way, not to pick on Apple. Oh, oh yeah. Um, and, and, but at least the article intimated there's not all the information is available through that API. So it, it's almost like, in my, I just, just suspecting here, Apple made some of it available so that it's not all, oh, we're keeping all that private, not letting you know what we have. Right. So maybe big. No, I think some of it some probably of it has away. legitimate business uses. Like, think about this. I don't know. This is a first world problem. Don't hate me for it. <laughs> but one of the things that I really hate when I'm flying and I'm trying to stream video on a, you know, an airline is that many of the airlines, when you log into their Viasat or whoever, however they're getting you online, you can't get like local programming or if I want to watch a football game or a baseball game, you know, and there are blackout restrictions because it can't tell my exact location. It prevents me from like watching a particular game or something like that. So the way to get around that used to be, I screw it. I'd log in via VPN while I'm online and make believe I'm in New York or Miami or LA or wherever I want to be. That's going to allow me to, watch the the, te- the game that I want. And what I've noticed is the planes Wi-Fi systems, it's not that they've gotten smarter, but they're detecting that I'm not, you know, this is a VPN in Miami, it don't work. And I suspect how they're doing that is they're probably looking at where the MAC address of how I'm connecting is coming from, mm-hmm. regardless of where my VPN says I'm logging in from. Right, so that might be a legitimate reason why you'd want to have that Mac address. Though it's not legitimate to me because I paid for the damn NFL subscription. I should be able to watch it anywhere I want. I agree. But, well, you it, know, it, shout out to Pittsburgh getting the 2026 NFL draft, by the way, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, okay, and, and our quarterback, but okay. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> the Broncos. Uh-huh. Well, if you connect a few more dots, so step back one more degree, if you will, you're using your VPN to watch Netflix or whatever. You know, let's say you travel to London or something, you want to watch your subscription from there. Well, they might be able to detect that you're using a VPN either on the phone or, you know, while you're there, maybe looking at IP addresses or something or the MAC address. But if you also step back and say, well, wait a minute, we've seen that MAC address in 25 places between Newark and landing and, and spending time in London, we know you were in London five seconds yeah. ago before you connected on to the VPN. Yeah, and, and that's what I mean. Yeah. And, but, so I guess the question then, though, becomes, Mitchell, is that a legitimate use, right? Should they be entitled to do that, or is that a little too big brothery for me? 
I know. Is there no privacy? Can I not, you know, so I can't no headlights on your car and turn on. What, what's no, I, I, you know, from uh, Machine Gun Joe, what's his oh. name? Joe McCarthy. Have you no decency, Senator? But <laughs> let me but, let me say hello to my little friend. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, it's a different movie. <laughs> not a different movie. Different movie. Different guy. But I mean, I I guess they have a right to know because you're not entitled to watch the NFL game in London. But mm -hmm. I am entitled to watch it while I'm flying from Florida to California. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and it thwarts me and it bums me out to no end. And I, I've, I've done some things. I'm, I'm you know, I'm not, You're not proud I'm of, not proud of, <laughs> but because <laughs> God, I'm not going to miss that game while I'm flying. That you climbing uh, up the pole to connect, bypass the cables block. Look, right? I'll never tell. You'll have to cut, you'll have to kill me first. <laughs> not that I wouldn't know anything about that. No, no, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching that game. Screw you. Anyway. Okay. Um, well, I think we've got to beat this dead horse. Uh, yeah, no, no, but it, it's, it's a legitimate reason. But go. you know what? Honestly, it could wind up costing you your life in a war zone. It could. In the wrong hands, it could be used against people very easily. Right? Absolutely. And it'd be interesting. I, I'm not sure if we've seen it yet in, uh, in court cases, but it'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Now, you have a topic to you speak. wanted to bring up. I did, did I? You did. You told me you did. You wanted to okay. talk about, was it the, um, this? no, it's not the CISO role that changed. We talked about it on uh, We talked about Textron Gang about, about the changing role of, of the CISO, yeah. Yeah, because of AI and all of that. Yeah, no, that was an AI, that was a Textron, and do check out Textron Gang on, on Textron TV. But no, I thought I had another clever thing going on in security, Mitch. Oh, and that, oh, now I remember what it was. Is the window closing on AI startups or is it just another cycle in the cyber world? You know, what we've seen, Mitch, in the last year, certainly, is <clears throat> VCs are falling over themselves, throwing what dollars they have into AI. And cyber security, AI cybersecurity companies are no exception. They've garnered a lion's share of the VC money available out there. And especially because, look, if you're a, a new AI security company, you're probably right, raising A A round, seed round kind of money. And that's where the money's going right now. No one wants yeah. to invest in some company that had an inflated round, you know, in 2022 or 2021. And now, you know, if you're not doing a down round, are you really getting your money's worth? They'd rather invest in something clean and new at a, yeah. at a better valuation. But, and, and so and that fueled a ton of these cybersecurity AI or AI cybersecurity startups. But now the big boys are coming in, right? Cisco, Palo Alto partnering with IBM, using right. Watson and stuff for it. CrowdStrike. Uh, thinking of big public cyber companies, and they're all jumping AI. Now, this is not new. This is how cyber works, right? These big companies will not let a... Once, once something starts going mainstream, they're not going to not feed it the trowel, mm -hmm. right? And and so they... they You know, they, they make their bets. Their bets are usually they don't develop their own solutions they, they buy they buy innovation yep and so you know a thing we learned mitch when we were still secure and and i learned working with brad feld who was a you know money behind still secure is if you're not in the top three in your space get the hell out yeah, because know. when these big guys are going to buy they're looking at top three usually right they want to buy leaders in in that space and so you got a lot of these AI cyber companies that look, their markets are immature. They got off a little later, maybe than the first mover. Um, whatever the reason, they're not in the top three. And now the big boys are coming in. And once the big boys come in, you need a lot of resources to compete. Exactly. So what is a what is an AI cyber company to do? Well, right, me, if they me, can't sell quick. Let me throw this wrinkle at you. 
because we, we went through this cycle it's still secure right um with our products one of them was an act product and you know suddenly cisco grabs up somebody else right so that we're not going to sell us our stuff to you know sell out to uh well, to no, cisco. now you got to compete with cisco right got to compete with them and damn the torpedoes <laughs> and pivot and say who else in market is a potential buyer for the company right so so accelerate to today <laughs> using that that phrase accelerate to today and how fast things change in the ai space you know that was something that happened over oh they you know probably months six to 12 or 18 months that that's kind of an exact acquisition evolved this could be like hey there's three companies out there go buy one now Right, right. There, and three months no later, time. if you still uh, if you're still standing after three four months, see. But I don't think pivot in this case means pivot to another competitor, mm. right? Because if you're not in the top three, that other competitor is not going to give you the valuation you want or your right. investors want. Exactly. I think in this case, pivot means find something else. Maybe move right? downstream you can in still the problem. Use AI, yeah. right? Use that technology, but use it for something else than your original business plan. Uh, I, I think that's going to happen because there are a bunch of AI cyber co- startups that worked down some good money mm-hmm. and now find themselves competing against Palo and IBM and, and Cisco and, and what have you. Um, but here's the good news. The smart ones will pivot into something new and novel and create yet another wave of innovation. Mm-hmm. And Mitch, that's the way it is in cybersecurity. It has been for as long as you and I are in it, right? These big companies, they buy innovation and the companies that get left over are kind of liquidated or pivot and re-innovate. Mm-hmm. Or languish, stick into their old model. Or die, right? They languish until they're dead and someone shoots them. But... Um, it, it's just, again, how quick time is moving in this AI time crunch that, you know, it's not quite two years since Gen AI kind of burst on the scene. November will be two years. It's a year and a half. And we're already seeing this cycle play itself out. You know, the, so step back for a moment, the, the IBM Palo Alto acquisition, not, not about Palo Alto. Not that partnership. They, Partnership, yeah, that's the right way to say it. You know, there was an AI component. We're going to partner on with IBM and use Watson uh, for some of their technology, their LLMs. But there was also the kind of security monitoring system that Palo took on in exchange, essentially, for buying the business of IBM using Palo's products and things. But they took, they kind of ingested an older, previously acquired SaaS application that. IBM, the longer well, no, used. they they bought QR QA uh, QR radar. Was QR, QR radar. A- That's the name. QR radar. It's a it's a sim, but it was the sim at the heart of IBM's security practice. Yeah, that was just curious to me that they, okay, they obviously probably still going to use it, or maybe they're moving on to something else. I don't know. Maybe it was time no, to jettison it. I, I it. think the IBM wants to sell security. They don't want to do security. And. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, QR Raiders are great for, for managed security providers. It's a cornerstone. But you remember Sim from our, you know, still secure days, Mitch. Been, been around for 20 years. You 20 got three to five million dollars and a couple of years to get it up and running. Then I got a Sim for you. I'm a Sim one. Yes. <laughs> it hasn't I gotten of, any better. I heard the phrase, phrase, it's not single pane of glass, it's single glass of pain. Right. <laughs> but, it, you know, look, in our day it was, it was QR radar, it was ArcSight, and there was the one that had the art, they they had like googly eyes, was, was there, yeah. kind of, uh-huh. out of Atlanta, they, they were a little lighter than the other two. But uh-huh. anyway, that's always been the case with Sim, and, and over the years, look, we've seen SOAR, S-O-A-R, mm-hmm. come out and kind of... Leap, not leapfrog, but it's it's an alternative if you're not doing pure sim. But you know when you look at IBM's and IBM had a big security team, right? I remember you remember too. Oh yeah, they bought the ISS business back in yeah. the day, and that Exports. really helped them establish a security. That was their credits. Line. 
That was really their yeah. Their no, well, well X Force and X Force is part of this deal yeah. too, right? X Force yeah. goes over to Palo. Um, but you know that was that the heart of that IBM. They they did a bunch of acquisitions in the subsequent years, but that was the heart of the IBM security offering. I wonder. Are they just going to sell Palo's security offering now? Or what, what's left of the IBM security offering? Well, it sounds like they're going to be pushing a lot of Palo products. So yeah, I don't know if it's in place of Sure Radar or if it, what, what it is. So this is a bit of a tangent. I have a question for you about this because one of my thoughts around why why sell this right now and there's a complex deal so there's lots of factors for doing that but one potential reason is the Splunk acquisition of or acquisition of Splunk by Cisco and the you know being positioned as a security company right you and I know Splunk from an IT operations log aggregation management well, the ball. you know what splunk always sort of resisted being a security company but it was mm -hmm. the bulk of their business it is and it is for others too they're not they're not yeah. the only sim that are that way and what i was wondering is are we seeing a sunset on the days of sim and uh, and observability in the security world is the thing that's i don't know if it's replacing it but that's the thing that so, fills in the big gaps we've got I don't think sims ever die and they don't fade away. They just take on observability and say, but look, <laughs> the fact of the matter is the people who started ArcSight and sold it for a couple billion bucks to HP yeah, are yeah. the same people who started Sumo Logic. Right. And, and Sumo, much like ArcSight and the rest of the sims, never claimed to be a security only thing they were it's very devopsy and and all of that and you know, observability and you know next gen but they were a sim it was they the oxide people doing sumo and now you know you've seen sumo went public and is a successful company but they've had some ups and downs mm -hmm. and you know they're going to try to reposition themselves as an observability solution um I think IBM made a conscious decision here that where do they play? They play in AI. They mm. put a ton of friggin' money into Watson. And the funny thing is IBM very well may have invented this whole AI thing with Watson. Mm -hmm. Right? But real quickly, open AI, DOS them. Right? <laughs> what Microsoft did with DOS, open AI is done with chat GPT to Watson. And and so they've seen this script before. They know they're in a war to be an AI player because the stakes are that big. So, and so they they got to make their bets. I think, and this is shifting, and I'm talking about Microsoft, but you look at the announcements that they've made in the last couple of weeks, I think we're, we're seeing Microsoft move from we're a cloud company to now we're an AI company. And I think that's the next and they generation put $10 of ten billion dollars of money in the open AI to prove it. And and look, we again we just discussed it today on the Tech Show Gang, right? Mm -hmm. They have now come out with an AI PC and they're talking more about hardware. Micro Bill Gates, well, he's not quite in his grave to roll over, but he's not doing cartwheels. Microsoft's become well, maybe they always did want to be hardware. But, you know, an AI PC, the surface. Uh, co-pilots in everything Azure and DevOps. Oh. Yes. Every company today is an AI. I'll do Mark Andreessen. AI's eating the world, right? Yeah. Every company today is an AI company, including Microsoft and including Google. Because last week we were at Google, not Google Next, Next, whatever Google's show was last week where they announced everything AI into everything mm. they're doing. IBM's going to do the same thing. They they want to be a powerhouse there. They've got their cloud strategy. They're finally, you can almost tell what, what IBM cloud is. They've got Red Hat mm -hmm. in there. I don't, I think they just felt like they couldn't do justice to keeping security a, a best in class solution without partnering with a, a palo or someone of that scale to to keep their security products 
top of line. Otherwise, they could have given it to HCL. Well, it, if you don't, I think every company is, you know, every technology provider company, you don't have a solid AI story that you're either rolling out or developing or, you know, it's it's got kind of long range legs. Then you're just a fill in, you're a observability company, you're just a monitoring, you're just a security company. And I think the market, the value, how you're going to be valued and viewed in the market, it's going to drop rapidly if you don't have a credible story. I, I, I agree with you 100%, and I think they're all rushing to it. But let me ask you the definitive question here, Mitchell. Yeah. Is an observability solution a security solution? Is an observability company a security company? Because I will tell you if that's the case, a rose by any other name would still smell as sweet, right? And so... Tomorrow, yesterday, sim is tomorrow's observability, but it's the same old, same old. Which is a whole nother topic. Um, I interviewed Austin Parker on his mm -hmm. uh, his new book about learning open telemetry. And it was kind of interesting. We talked about the book and learning and why he wrote the book and all that kind of stuff. But the latter half of that conversation was all about, if you really step back and what open, open telemetry and observability is doing, it's clutching data to basically metrics, right, to correlate and, and make observations about. And his point was, he thinks observability is going to be a business tool, not just an IT tool. So think about measuring all this data we're getting from applications and customer experience and financial data, whatever it might be. You could create KPIs on any kind of information or uh, monitoring, if you will, um, around any kind of telemetry data, and the more we're overrun or kind of create all this data, he thinks that's that's where open telemetry and observability is going to. It's not an IT or a security tool. It's the next generation business tool. I thought it was pretty yeah. fancy. It is. I mean, it, you know, the whole open telemetry thing is, is you yeah. know, that's like a business school, uh, you know, case study. Case that, study, yeah. That, yeah, I mean, it just it rocks and rolls, and, and it underpins almost that whole industry now, this whole observability industry that we used to call. It's funny. It's it's it encompasses them. What we used to call APM, APM. right? Is all it's all observability now. So it, it's interesting times. I mean, you know, it's funny. We I look at the agenda that our editorial team comes up with every day for Tech Strong Gang, and it just blows my mind the the sheer volume of ai news across every single silo we cover mm. but that's that's the time frame we're in right now and and, and you, you might it. you can embrace it or you can you know roll over and die <laughs> i mean what do you change want me to or be changed you? right yeah Your exactly choice. that yeah exactly that's how it is better to be what is it better to be pissed off from I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> anyway, Mitch, this was a great security boulevard. Let's end it right there. Okay. I think um, we should wrap things up and, you know, thank everybody for listening and watching. And well, especially folks have been with us for over the years. We've been doing this for a while from back on the still secure after, after all, all these, these years. years and, absolutely. And, and uh, you know what? Do check out Security Boulevard because it probably publishes more security content than any other security site on the planet. Depends. Thanks to our security content creators network and all the great folks over at TechStrong. And so check that out. If you're cruising the boulevard for cyber news, there's only one boulevard to cruise. The way to and go. That's Security Boulevard. That's right. where you want to be. It's, you know, all the cool kids are there. Yep. <laughs> All right. And your celluloid heroes, just to yes, bring it full circle. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we get started on another tangent, <laughs> that's doesn't right. take much. <laughs> so, this is uh, Mitch Ashley and Alan Schimmel. And you've been listening to the Security Boulevard Chat. Yeah, baby. On the Boulevard.